Hello, everyone. It's so good to be with you today. Thank you, Allison. Um, we're so glad to have with us today uh, Nora Naranjo Morris and her daughter, Eliza Naranjo Morris. Both uh, Nora and Eliza have art in our latest exhibition, Remembering the Future. We are showing from our permanent collection, Nora's ceramic sculpture, Perline, and Eliza's painting, Portrait of Ultimate Happiness. I'll just give you a brief introduction about these two artists and then we'll get to hear from them. Nora Naranjo Morris is an award-winning sculptor working with clay, bronze, and most recently with discarded material. She has exhibited nationally and internationally in single artist and group exhibitions. In addition to her visual art, she is a published poet and filmmaker. Visitors to the herd see Nora's bronzes before they even enter the museum. The male and female figures, Kwe Seng, made in 1991, are in the courtyard. And to the right of our main entrance is in the Aspens, imagining the earth that Nora did in 2000. She was in our seventh biennial invitational in 1997 with an installation on commodity food. In 2007, Nora's design won the National Museum of the American Indian Outdoor Sculpture Competition. Uh, it was a design that's greeting visitors to NMAI in Washington, DC. The sculptural installation is called Always Becoming and its selection made Nora first Native American woman artist to have sculpture on the National Mall. Nora's book, Mud Woman, Poems from the Clay is part of the University of Arizona Suntrack series and includes some poems about Perlene, who's been a visitor favorite at the herd since she has appeared in Earth Hands Life exhibition in 1988. Perlene has spent a lot of time with our visitors. Yes, there she is in remembering the future. Yeah. Okay. Eliza Naranjo Morris's art has also included clay. She incorporates it into her paints along with a variety of organic material that she applies to canvas. Eliza's formal art training includes a BFA degree she received in 2003 from Skidmore College in New York. Uh, studied figure drawing and painting at IAIA and figure drawing at Parsons School of Design. Eliza was the 2008 Roland and Mary Ella King Native Artist Fellow at the School for Advanced Research. She's shown internationally, including in Veracruz, Mexico, in Ekaterinburg, Russia. And in 2008, she, Nora, and Eliza's cousin, Rose Simpson, were selected to create a collaborative work for Site Santa Fe's seventh international biennial exhibition. Her other exhibitions, uh, in museums include Mothers and Daughters at the Herd in 2009. And in 2016, she was in Forward at IAI's Museum of Contemporary Native Art. It included a 38 foot mural named, And We Will Live Off the Fat of the Land. And most recently in 2020, she created another mural, All Together Making Our Way Everyday Medicine that is on exhibition now at the Wheelwright Museum in Santa Fe. So welcome, Nora and Eliza. It's great to have you here. There's my woman. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Anne. This is so exciting. <laughs> I want so much to talk with you about the pieces that you're going to show us. So let's get started. Go ahead and show us what you've prepared. OK, great. We've got a um, slide presentation. And so we'll uh, share our screen. and. Um, share images to go to go along with words um
I'm going to start talking um, um, first. Um, I get a little nervous, but um, I'm going to be brave today and start talking first. Um, I want to share with you today um, my experience and, and my artistic creative trajectory in, in uh, my processes uh, with clay and then other mediums that I've been experimenting with um, over the past 20, 25 years. I want to start by talking um, and showing you this picture of uh, Gregorita Tafoya. This was taken in the late 40s, um, and it's a black and white of a Santa Clara Pueblo woman um, digging clay from the earth. And this is a common sight um, in my youth. I remember going with women very much like Gregorita uh, to gather clay from the mountains here in northern New Mexico with my mom and other women who were potters. Um, in fact, I would just walk from one house to the next uh, when I was growing up and there would be women um, in all of these homes that were that had pottery clay work in some stage of um, finish while I was growing up. Uh, so I was around clay all my life. And because of that, I think I really relate to this picture. Um, I really see that I am this woman as well. And in Pueblo thinking, um, when you go to this clay deposit to gather clay, one of the first things you do is um, you go through the ritual of um, thanking the clay and um, welcoming it into your life. And then in a sense, connecting with this enmity um, that is the clay woman, clay mother, um, and, and in, this, in this connection and in this, um, of beginning of your process, you're offering yourself, you're um, offering the gratitude of being able to collect the clay and this promise that you're going to do the best you can with what you're gathering. This was foundational for me in, in my experience. <clears throat> that didn't mean that I was, <clears throat> This, this promise and this um, exchange with the clay mother did not mean that I was going to make traditional clay pottery. Um, everyone that I was seeing in the community, my sisters make pottery, my um, cousins, my aunties, they were all making vessels and they were all just stunning in the Pueblo tradition. I had a harder time with that because maybe because my personality or just the things I wanted to do with my work, <coughs> excuse me, I started making forms. And the very beginning forms were very small um, and they were more creature-like, anthropo, um, what is that word? Anthropomorphic. Morphic. Yeah. Um, I always get my, I always get tongue tied at the last part, but they were clay beings that were um, really speaking to what I was going through as a contemporary Pueblo person. And if you'll notice with Pearlene, this particular Pearlene, which I think is in the, um, the herd uh, collection, is that her, her stance is really very strong and she is definitely connected to the earth. And um, that was important for me to show she's anchored to this earth. And what she's holding and offering is this tradition that she also grew up with. And that was the Kosa, the clowns that appear in Pueblo villages on ceremonies um, and during feast days. She was holding them out and basically, even though she was a contemporary um, art piece, she was letting you know very definitely that she was anchored to the earth 
she was anchored to that commitment and prayer that um, my aunties and, and my family um, held in, in such high regard, um, that connection to the earth. And so she was um, really the first, first time I made a perline, I was pretty impressed that I could coil um, something so large because yes. before perline, they were relatively small. Um, perline, this perline in particular is um, completely hollow. So she's coiled in the traditional way of uh, Pueblo pottery making. She just doesn't look like a pottery from Santa Clara. <laughs> Yeah. By then too, um, I was with Perlene, I was um, really using her to articulate some of the things that I was thinking about and um, processing as a young woman. And um, I was also in the process of making Perlene, the first Perlene's, I was also thinking about myself and how I connected to um, <clears throat> the clay, but also to the rest of the world. And so that figured prominently, that sort of balance between these two um, worlds that I was sort of navigating at that point. Mm, <clears throat> I started expanding after Perlene and I made, a, I made Perlene for, you know, two or three years. Uh, and I was experimenting in different scenarios, Perlene with a credit card, Pearlene uh, going to town, uh, Pearlene playing poker with her close uh, uh, cousins after coming back from Las Vegas and learning how to play poker. <laughs> um, so there were all of these little scenarios that um, Pearlene was articulating for me um, during that period of time. In that process, <clears throat> someone asked me if I would consider mass producing Pearlene. And when I, uh, when somebody approached me to that, it, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't imagine doing it. And that was a pretty critical moment for me in my creative development in that I thought a lot about that moment of standing in front of the clay at the clay pit and making a promise that I was going to try and be, um, honor the clay. And to mass produce it seemed like con contradiction to that um, thought. And so I told the person no, that I couldn't do it. And in the same moment, I realized that I had finished making Perlene. She had brought me to a, a particular point in my trajectory, my artistic uh, trajectory. And so at that moment, I went home <clears throat> and I made the last Perlene. And Pearlene was sitting on a couch with a fancy boa around her neck. And she looked kind of as sexy as Pearlene could be. She looked kind of sexy. <laughs> and she was sitting next to her bow who had a bow tie and some flowers. And so there was obviously this scenario of romance and love. And, you know, um, I wanted Pearlene to have that. So um, I finished the last Pearlene with her bow. And um, I think the Arizona Univers the um, Northern Museum of Arizona purchased that piece and it's there now. And at that point, um, I made the scary decision to start experimenting with different materials. Mm. Around that time, the Heard Museum asked if I would, um, oh, they commissioned a piece. And um, this piece, um, standing in the Aspens, imagining um, the world, is drawn from an experience I had in Taos with my family in the mountains. I was a young girl and we were all gathered there to gather wood and um, it was the fall and it was beautiful. The Aspens were in their glorious yellow and reds. And, I was at a distance watching my family um, doing these traditional acts of gathering. And uh, 
I almost, it was almost a surreal moment because I felt like I was watching what the world was supposed to be like. This is the way it was supposed to be like gathering, being with family and the fact that we were in, in the mountains, in nature, appreciating it um, and being a part, a, a part of it was uh, the inspiration for, for this particular piece, even though it was out of metal. And the reason why it had to be out of metal is because it was gonna be an outdoor piece. And um, if you can, the picture is of this spirit form um, standing among these sticks uh, and looking at the sphere that is in the distance. And you can see that in the picture on the sort of middle right-hand side of the image. There's a, the way it was installed, the second installation uh, at the Heard Museum was uh, closer to the building for safety. And um, it was really fun because we were able with a landscape architect to create this pathway through um, through the piece so that you could actually walk through and get a sense of um, what this piece was about. Okay. I love this picture. Um, this is an old building. I think it was done in the late 17, 1777 around there. Um, it's a building uh, made out of adobe and it's, wa it's wearing away from just um, the seasons, the sun, the snow, the rain. And uh, uh, it's so monumental that it still holds a presence. And what it speaks about is that the people that were there in this land and uh, who lived in this land before us, had already developed a real sophisticated way of house building. Um, they were also still connected to the earth. There is this continuum that I keep coming back to with my work is um, that um, the material, uh, organic material is really important to me. Um, and again, it goes back to that place where um, the clay begins, where I begin with that clay and that promise. Um, this is around um, near, near Georgia O'Keeffe's house in Abiquiu. And um, I draw inspiration for this piece uh, when I applied for um, the National Museum of the American Indian was having an open competition. I think it was in 2005. Um, and there were like, several thousand um, applicants, applications sent out. Uh, and I was one of them. I uh, read the, I, I read the description and immediately I went back to that um, building that you just saw uh, that was done in um, late 1700s. Uh, and I thought, well, what if I make I take these materials that are so important to Pueblo people here in the Southwest and I transfer them to Washington DC to um, speak to the issues of organic material, culture, environment, family, and um, the aspect of um, the continuum that once a a vessel like in Santa Clara is used, it will be put outside or if it breaks during firing, it's left outside to go back into the earth. So there, again, there's that continuum of um, materials and people going back into the earth. Um, this piece was, well, to my surprise, I got selected, um, which really was quite a surprise because the pieces are ephemeral which is in total contrast to um, a lot of the pieces, uh, other pieces on the mall in DC. They're very stagnant and they're made out of um, steel, metal, um, other metals and concrete and stone. I wanted this to be different. I wanted to uh, 
the materials to speak to the uh, worldview of a Pueblo people. So we used clays, straw, sand, and rocks, and a lot, a lot of dirt. Um, it's been, it's been like about 12 or 13 years now, and they do not look like this anymore. They're starting to go back down into the earth. And I think at the beginning, um, that kind of concept is, is really foreign to a lot of institutions. But I think because we, uh, I and now Eliza, because she's become a part of Always Becoming, um, we go back uh, almost every year and we, we don't try to keep them looking like this, but we, are with them and we are um, making their transition back into the earth graceful and have dignity and um, we care for them every year that we go back and so there's been this this whole um, really beautiful um, gathering of people who um, help us every year from NMAI and the, the their support has really just been quite quite amazing to me and so these pieces are cared for uh, <clears throat> and just the other day I guess NMAI was having some kind of um, pumpkin uh, for Halloween some kind of pumpkin carving um, little competition and so <laughs> somebody from NMAI I think the conservation um, department uh, made a replica out of pumpkins <laughs> um, of always becoming, and they got a prize. So the spirit award. <laughs> the, the yeah. spirit award. <laughs> so always becoming has really be, has has these tentacles that reach out um, um, back, and in fact, they come. Always becoming has um, become um, projects that come back into the our community. Um, Liza and 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 I did a project with the children at our. Um, Santa Clara uh, Community School, Kapo'owinge Community School. Um, and we made smaller uh, versions of, of Always Becoming. And that was really, that was just so beautiful to see the kids working with mud and um, learning how, what the materials are. And um, because uh, Eliza was um, spearheading this, she was making sure that, um, a lot of these uh, words of uh, the the material was interpreted in uh, Tewa, so that the kids were getting an understanding of um, the language as well. And I can't remember when I was asking Liza when we did this piece. This again, this is the herd for the mother and daughter show. Uh, in, I think it was 2000, did you say, Two, Anne? 2009. 2009, mm -hmm. okay. And this is a mural and um, you used graphite and pencil, right? Clay, clay. Uh, micaceous clay and graphite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned about Always Becoming was this wonderful collaboration and NMAI and, uh, and Always Becoming have been great collaborators together. And that uh, I think that has inspired me to, um, to collaborate with people. And so the first person I wanted to collaborate was with Eliza because we've been hanging out together for so long. Um, and so in this piece, she had one whole wall that were these clouds and these beautiful, um, this, this, this beautiful scene um, made out of pencil and uh, clay. Mm -hmm. And what I, my contribution were, um, was 5,500 clay balls. And you can see them here at the very right hand corner and they get incorporated into Eliza's, um, into Eliza's graphic piece. And uh, this, this was pretty, I love this piece. Yeah. 
goodness. Um, you want to say anything about that? Maybe I, I will. I'm thinking of where to start now. Um, so, so clearly I, I have had a lifelong art education um, that has been absolutely defining and significant in my life. Um, and really mostly through watching um, my mom go through her life and um, um, visiting her in her studio, trying to distract her in her studio to see if she'll, she's going someplace besides UPS or, <laughs> you know, that, but, but having a relationship of driving her pieces out to museums, watching her um, find feather boas to put on Perlene, this, uh, and, and this um, very creative and experimental process that was, um, as I observed, always, always, rooted in a form of relationship with uh, the land, with the traditions that she was coming from and having active growing relationship with um, and with herself becoming um, a woman growing up. And so um, goodness, I just, you know, I really am proud and, and endlessly fortunate to honor that, that that form of learning from my mom and um and 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 i guess to speak to this this piece for just a moment um that that it really that the her 5000 discs and balls were created of the same material as my uh wall drawing called common cloud um but certainly in the same the same spirit of um relationship to land uh, or place and material and um and then this this I, I look at this piece and i'm reminded of her generosity because this in the center of this piece is this large large clay disc um that she had brought with us and then as she finished playing with light and arranging her beads to look like this this beautiful dance of of light and clay moving through the space up in the rafters all around she gave this uh disc to me and said you know you should use it do put it where you want it to and i think that that this piece in particular speaks to the generosity of her um sharing of knowledge um and I, I want to say that because I, I, I think that as we go along with my sub slides, um, I am certainly an, a, engaged in a, a formal art practice of making work uh, and an underlying, perhaps a very obvious part of the theme of it, but a, a real underlying current is that generosity of knowledge sharing that she has given to me. And I think that I feel um, so I, you know, I feel so fortunate for that. I that that to share it or to to observe it and witness it when it is happening around me is um, certainly a huge is a huge part of my own um, uh, um, effort in making work. Um, so you know, I I went off to school and then came back to. Uh, ooh, did we go? Is the other way? Let's see. Pardon. Um, uh, and then came back uh, and uh, returned back to these materials of um, micaceous clay and uh, um, different colors clays that were both available to me at that point because I didn't have resources to buy things like oil paint and um, well, I think that I, I also, after being away for four years, really needed to find a way to ground, to recenter, to become uh, into another form of art education that was just completely different than what I had gathered. Mm -hmm. um, I think took a, I'm probably still processing w w what that meant. Um, but I came home and uh, I enjoyed, I very much enjoyed figure drawing, which I did quite a bit of at Skidmore. And um, 
in an assignment at the community college. The community college is in uh, Santa Fe has great uh, continuing education, probably most community colleges do. And that's a fantastic offering for uh, older students. And so I would go on Saturdays and do um, um, figure drawing mostly. One of, one of the assignments was uh, to draw a portrait of yourself in, in ultimate happiness. Um, and uh, the idea of drawing a self-portrait did not in any way uh, inspire ultimate happiness at that point in my life. And so I um, used materials that brought me happiness, um, be micaceous clay, um, charcoal, and um, drew an animal because I it, 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 it brings me great happiness to draw animals. And I think I was just discovering that at that moment, how, how comfortable I felt drawing animals. Um, there's also this black um, line, this pathway that for me, I think at that point was a visual tool. This, this deer is sort of curiously like testing out this, this, this path. Um, and looking back at this piece, I think that I created around 2008, Date, dates get kind of blurry, but I think, oh, this was um, really a beginning of, of, of a path. Um, this piece was um, purchased by David and Sarah Lieberman, who I want to acknowledge or shout out to because they were, um, um, enormously supportive in our lives mm -hmm. of, of a creative process. And I'm, I'm very thankful to, to them for that. And just, you know, wanna give a shout out to Sarah for that. So then they donated this work to the herd and I'm thankful for that as well. Yes. Um, Can I finish the- uh, Yeah, let's go back. I'm sorry, that must've, should we go start yeah. there? Okay, so I, I, I wanted to say that, um, When we did um, Always Becoming, I was um, very aware of how these pieces were going, because they're ephemeral, how they're going to fall, back, how they're going to dissolve back into the earth. Um, if you'll notice in this picture, there are all of these beads, right? These are part of the 5,500 beads that um, I made. <laughs> Um, for the piece of, in the mother and daughter show that, you know, Eliza and I collaborated. And so um, once the exhibit was over, I brought them home and I tied them around a tree and uh, they stayed there for a couple of years until um, Always Becoming had a phase two. And in during the phase two, I started really thinking about repurposing um, the materials that I was using. So I, I brought a lot of these beads and you can see them in the bag and, and, and just sort of falling onto the ground. Um, I wanted to place them in an actual piece of always becoming. And so created a, 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 a mound and we filled these, um, we, we filled the mound with these uh, beads. And so when it's dissolving down, the beads start to show up. We can go to the next thing. So you can see them um, in, oh, yeah. in this new sculpture. Yeah. And so that, that whole idea of repurposing, continually repurposing, was really important for me as well, because that was setting me up for this next um, this next phase of the work I've been doing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, and I, I, I wanna read something from um, Mud Woman because yesterday I was looking for something to finish my part of this talk. And I wanted, I, I went back to Mud Woman and um, I found this um, couple sentences. I am in awe of the clay that fills me with passion and wonder. This earth that I have become a part of, that I have grown out of. And I think that's exactly how I feel 
when I go get clay and I start working with this clay material. And yeah. so um, even though I'm not making um, vessels um, in, in a traditional sense, I am still creating that same um, commitment to um, that clay pit that I, I gather the clay from. Yes, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Let's see, so then to continue um, so this was an artwork made out of clay and acrylic paint um, that was uh, a mural, I think it was around 38, 38 feet long um, at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art um, around 2015 for an exhibit um, that I was, um, I think I was invited by Candace Hopkins um, to use the space and um, um, create like a little a little art exhibit, uh, which was a wonderful opportunity. Um, this piece is called "And Will Live Off the Fat of the Land," and I also think of it as as forward um, uh, because that was the name of the exhibit that also included some little sculptures. Um, Um, uh, let's see, I, I guess before I, I'll, let's see, I'll, I'm going to read the statement for this, this piece and for the, ex, the little exhibit of forward, uh, as a way to describe, um, the, the intent of it. Perhaps we yearn to make our lives good and find balance because even when we feel completely challenged, there is the unrelenting proof in each of us that we are survivors, that we are the result of our ancestors' histories and that eventually we will become ancestors. This collection of work interprets facets of this thought. And so this mural inter interprets that thought that we're all, um, waking up every day carrying the people that we come from. And as my mom tells me and reminds me, they're, the, they're pushing us forward. Um, uh, so this, this, this piece described, describes that. Um, I also want to just acknowledge uh, Andrea Hanley who, who supported the piece uh, in, in, in its, curation and then after uh, and then ongoing while it was exhibited so I'm very thankful for her her um, contribution of support um, in um, 2018 I created an, a series of illustrations that were considering this um, this journey and this path you know, really begun by portrait of ultimate happiness. And so I began thinking about the environment that these figures existed in and their purpose. Um, this is called We Are, it's made out of watercolors. It was um, shown at the Co Center through, uh, for the Arts in Santa Fe and um, in Axel Contemporary. Um, both wonderful uh, institutions that support uh, support artwork. Um, in this piece, uh, I was. You can see that it's this this animal figure um, moving, and in my mind, it's steadily climbing towards the top of a mountain, um, not giving up. It's carrying a large load, and this. I, I think at this point I was still trying, working around considering what are we carrying with us? Um, what are these steps we're taking for? What, it, what is our purpose? And um, there were, I don't know how clearly they're illustrated, but there's a shovel and a rake um, as sort of metaphors for that, that work we do. There's a plant actually that's very common around uh, the, in the area of the herd and down south, Ocotillo, which is um, very powerful um, 
plant medicine for um, clearing our systems. And um, I think of like um, creating a new pathway. So as an um, appreciation or acknowledgement to that plant and its power uh, included, included that in this drawing uh, or watercolor called, called We Are. There's also this big, beautiful cloud with moisture around it. It's raining, it's abundant. It's, it's, it's a, this is an illustration of, 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 of health and perseverance. Uh, this piece is, is now owned by um, Ed, Ed Guarino. Um, um, in that same time, in witnessing people and in myself, in the messages my mom was teaching me or my community was teaching me of um, perseverance and meeting every day. Um, I was also and am and, um, and also very aware of where that process is being impeded for people. Um, this is a watercolor called Hurt. Um, um, and it's, uh, was made in the same series as the previous image above, you know, perseverance and abundance and health. And this was this, uh, sort of the, my mind, um, needing to acknowledge that, that the reality of, of, of our world where, where, um, pilgrimage um, is, is, is cruelly being impeded for others. Um, uh, again, there's the, the ocotillo as a form of, of, of blessing or take, trying to process or take care of the, 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 the cruelness of this, this scenario. Um, and then last, let's see, lastly, uh, this is a, a piece that I made recently. Um, I've started using the computer to draw, which is brand new for me. I'm not tech savvy, but uh, uh, Procreate, a drawing program has, has opened an enormous door for me and my ability to use color and, um, and move through concepts more quickly, like brought me on a roll. It's also very draining on my eyes and uh, in my body and, uh, to sit at a computer, which we've all done a lot of in the last two years, I bet we've done, most of us have done more of that is there's a certain dream, but um, certainly has, has made col color experimentation possible. Um, this piece is called Light from Love. Um, it was made in 2020. Mm, and it is sort of a, a present, day after coming years and years from ultimate happiness uh, to um, a larger thought of, of hope or of where we're going when we're going through our days. And um, so in this piece, it depicts all of the animals coming from their journeys and the, the destination of both um, gathering the power of, of people gathering and a possibility. They're coming to this center where then it just opens up entirely. And um, it's a, for me, it's a beautiful piece. I wanted to create something that honors the beauty of people working to, together um, towards possibility. Um, during COVID, I was, uh, and you know, all along, um, always impressed and in admiration and in a uh, desire to champion efforts where people are thinking about others and wanting to bring them along, um, wanting to be in relationship. And so I think of these strong animals carrying their knowledge systems. This is what now I'm thinking, what are all these bundles, these fabrics holding? Um, they're holding, um, knowledge systems, they're holding efforts, they're holding, uh, they're holding um, um, good, good work and gathering it towards, towards a center that, that, that then expands to possibility. Um, 
uh, I'll, oh, I'll finish by saying that during COVID, I was really struck um, working in a, a school, but also working in museum institutions, primarily indigenous museum institutions, where in this format where their work, which was to meet an audience and, and sh sh show work and support a community was shifted drastically. I was just stunned by the museum's ability to then blossom into another form of supporting a commu communities and supporting the, the work, the living, the living um, creations that they hold in their collections um, and sharing them in different ways. And then really thinking of um, the future of what museum institutions mean and what, what their role in community is. I, I, I just have to give a shout out to the Fo Center in Pewaukee for the way they do that, the Co Center for the Arts, MIAC, SAR, the Folk Art Museum in Santa Fe. I have been very privileged to just have little uh, witnessings of how these, these places are becoming and just and, and think it's totally beautiful and exciting. Uh, to finish, I'll read. I, I can't call it a poem because the words are, are not as crafted, but um, I'm gonna share some words that I wrote about this piece. Um, light from love. Trails had begun to disappear their own lifetimes ago. Still, the pilgrimage continued. At some point along the quiet way, each realized time was left behind and that the color within their prayers became the particular hue of previously unknown possibility. Hearing breath beyond their own fed their tired limbs. It was the light of love for others that had been guiding them all along. Um, Beautiful. Beautiful. So to finish up, we'll come back to collaboration and I'll just, uh, let's see, introduce this idea by saying we wanted to finish um, by sharing our most recent collaboration in its concept stages. Um, but we worked over the last year on creating this, this, this um, concept uh, for a site-specific installation, um, which my mom will share. share about now and I'll do the pictures for. Arriving with light evokes the brilliance of our collective human spirit. The work encourage us, encourages us in our search for conscious and respectful human and non-human relationships. Arriving with light is a large scale sculptural installation that speaks to the connectedness of all people and the vital force every individual potentially brings to the world. Arriving with light invites the viewer to position themselves as a part of a shared journey that speaks to inclusivity and possibility. This um, piece, uh, Arriving with Light, was um, was created and is still in pro probably in the process of becoming um, in, in that um, we have done the, the fun foundational work for it, I would imagine. Um, and so um, we are just waiting for a new place to an institution or some other opportunity where this piece will be able to shine and arrive at that light <laughs> um, oh. with our help. So um, unfortunately, uh, it was supposed to go to Florida. That was not that did not work out. So we're we're hopeful that at some point we'll be able to um, uh, share this collaboration. That it really is um, was kind of pivotal for us in our growth, in our in, in our separate growth, in our growth um, together, and so it's a really important piece for us. And hopefully, um, can we go back for just a second? Um, yeah, 
back one more. This, um, these pieces would, the tallest one maybe being what, 11 feet high, wow. the smallest one being about four feet high, would have internal light coming out. So at night, you would, this is what you would see. Gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I, I'll note too that inside of these sculptural, sculptural elements are um, um, plexiglass discs with images of our collaborative artwork um, with um, holes in them in, located in different areas so that you can see through the, in, the entire body of all, uh, what is it, eight sculptures? Um, so you and and so people can walk through the space and see each other within within them and um, sort and, and have an interaction with them. Um, we should, yeah, yeah. So this was a, a piece created in a it, um, plan to go to Florida through. Um, uh, I should we I feel like we should acknowledge Lance Fung and, from Lance, yeah, and Fung Collaboratives for supporting the concept um, into this this state of its it's being and, and can you go to the last one because uh the next yeah see so you can see it here um someone putting up their baby so the baby can see inside these um sculptural forms to see those see. Uh, graphics inside <sighs> so wonderful <laughs> you just you just keep moving on from from one beautiful uh, material, you know, to another. To uh, Nora, you've done uh, some kinetic sculpture too, haven't you? Um, well, yes, I I have in in the in this new direction I'm going, which is a um, recycled material, and yeah. you know all those beads that I was telling you about that were in the exhibit at the herd. Uh -huh. uh, for the mother and daughter show, um, I I used them at Always Becoming, but that really was pivotal for me because it started making me think about um, what we consume and what we um, discard, and all of these things that um, are made of natural material that I've been doing uh, still hold um, a preciousness, still hold value. And I think that's true, like that, those, that, that structure I showed you of that home, that still has value because I go mm -hmm. there, think about the history of building, of the people who lived there, mm -hmm. uh, of all the things that have been happening in, in this area. And that really represents that to me. And so I take these ideas mm -hmm. and I sort of cross pollinate them in whatever I'm doing. And so the new, um, the, the new experimentation for me is working with discarded material. And um, I'm really excited because at this point I'm making a 16 foot long um, sculpture made of old burlap chili bags and thousands and thousands of Walmart bags. You know, those bags you get at Walmart that are seemingly endless in endless yes. supply. Yes. Bags, plastic bags. I'm um, stuffing the, the, the all 16 feet of him with plastic bags. And I'm speaking to the issue of, um, you know, what we consume mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, yes. what we discard. So that's yes. what I've been working on. Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to see some. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh <laughs> It's big. It's you big know, and um. But both of you have, uh, you know, I, I've seen photos. I've seen photos of of um, always becoming, and uh, Eliza. I've seen uh, uh, some of the installation that was going on with your murals and things like that. And uh, these are projects you've talked about collaborating, but these are projects where you're collaborating with so many people. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it, that's got to be a, um, a whole nother layer of complexity and <sighs> yes, it is right. Well, what are your impressions of like when you go to always coming and 
especially in DC at this point in time. Yeah, you know, really. there are a lot of people because there, I, I, at that one point, there was like a 1.2 million people going right past in that corridor on um, mm -hmm. the Smithsonian Mall, going past Always Becoming. And people were stopping. What are you doing? What, you know, this is so unlike the capital mm -hmm. this is so unlike the monuments that we're seeing what what yeah. is this and this is a real opportunity for us to talk about um mm -hmm. um public culture and the wor world view um so it was re really great to to have those people be interested yeah uh yeah and i don't know about your your impressions and what you have to say gosh you know i, I think there's a lot a we lot. could say about collaborating uh, what a, a ch an incredible uh, challenging um, heart opening mm -hmm. heart deepening connecting experience collaboration is um, the, the concept of collaboration in general and as I'm, I'm, I'm learning it it's um, it's almost the, the, it becomes more and more com complex. Um, but I, I think that there's a really, there are maybe two really beautiful things that I'd like to share about m my current understanding of collaboration. One is that it, it changes the, um, or I believe it contributes to changing the, the conversation of the Western Forum of Art. This idea that you make something and that then it gets sold and then you become yes. more well known and then hopefully get more gallery shows. And it, I think that it, it, it brings art into a place that from what I learned from my mom is where for me an enormous heart of it is that it's, it's about a relationship. And so when you can create something with many other people and their hearts become involved, um, that's a really beautiful form of artwork and it, yes. it exists without that structure that um without it, it exists you know in a way outside of that western structure um yeah, yeah um <laughs> and, and and then also because eliza has become a part of the always becoming um caretaking um it becomes very generational mm just like pottery in, in the Pueblos becomes very generational. This this has become, you know, Liza is an important voice in Always Becoming Now. And so it, it, it uh, really speaks to how that knowledge gets passed down, gets passed down. It's beautiful, that's beautiful. Allison, I, I'm looking at uh, uh, some questions. Yeah, I, we do have um, one question and a couple of comments. I'll just go ahead and start with the comments. And, you know, I think this one really kind of sums up the entire sentiment of our viewers is that this presentation has evoked a very sentimental and emotional feeling. And there are no words to describe how thankful our viewers are to have this opportunity. Aww. Yeah, I thought that was nice. Uh, the one question that I do have uh, is for Nora, you know, the name Perlene. How did you come up with that? I have a cousin named Perlene. <laughs> I had a cousin named Perlene. Well, per I love the name Perlene. It just, it just, I love, <laughs> I love that name. And I love that cousin. Um, and I was telling Diana Pardue um, that um, when I was younger, uh, and, and and highly influenced by older cousins who, <laughs> in my case, happened to be naughty. Um, I was just on board. I wanted to be those tight fitting. I wanted to be in those tight fitting skirts. I wanted to smoke a cigarette. I wanted to stand behind <laughs> the, the the barn and and tell dirty jokes. I wanted all those things, and my cousins were very ripe in telling me those things, and so. <laughs> Perlene sort of um, articulated, uh, was an articulation of that period of time, of that wonder and that um, excitement to be alive and, and you know, to, to talk trash while you're smoking with your cousins. <laughs> that was the perfect thing for me and, and I fit right in. And so when I was thinking about Perlene and her intentions, I uh, went immediately back to, um, these cousins I knew. So yes, Perlene comes from a real person, is influenced by a real person. 
yeah. per se. <laughs> I, I think though she speaks to, we, a lot of us have had cousins like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and Joy Harjo, I'm looking at the back of your book, Nor, um, Joy Harjo talking about it said, uh, Perlene is the wild thing in all of us. Mm hmm So. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah. No, strong woman though. I, I, I appreciated what you said about her stance, you know, that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very anchored. Yeah, yeah. And I will just say too, Eliza, um, you know, we've had your mom's writing about Perlene and you create characters that I want their story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want, I'm not good enough to make up I, I, you know, but I, I look at them and I want to know, I want that you talk about pilgrimage. I want to know where they're, I care about them. And that's just mm -hmm. such a wonderful thing that you brought these characters into people's reality. So. Uh, there was, there was one in drawing in particular where, um, and I don't know the name of it, where they're, they're guns and they're putting the animals in the cages. Mm -hmm. um, that is particularly uh, uh, it, important to me because you first see it and it's, oh, a cartoon. You know, the surface of it is this cute cartoon, but then you look closer and there's this whole other thing that's happening. And I think that's, um, that really evokes the sense of curiosity and the, the inspection of layers and layers of meaning, which I think is really, uh, yeah. It's important. It's important. Yes. It's important. Thank you. It's important work. Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you. Well, I think that's all from our viewers in terms of questions. I think, you know, I'm going to echo another comment that was just made, which was, um, you know, this has been such a beautiful collaboration of this presentation. So I think it's just been such, a, you know, a real uh, honor and joy to kind of hear from both of you and go through both of your artistic practices. So I want to say thank you both. Uh, it's, thank you. Thank it's you great. Much. And I love really seeing, especially to, you know, the newer works that you're both collaborating on and the new ways in which you're continuing to experiment and uh, evolve and change. And it's just, I hope to see a lot of those pieces in person soon. I also encourage anyone that's watching this to come down and see the exhibition if you haven't done so already and to come see both of your pieces. They are just stunning along with all the rest of the artwork in the exhibition, I have to say. And I mean, I know you uh, were really the lead on this curatorial project, but um, there are pieces that I've never seen and I've been here for 10 years and it's just, it's great seeing old friends and new surprises. So um, thank you again. Truly appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today. This has been great, Eliza, thank Nora, thank you so much. And I'll look forward to the time yeah. when we're not Zooming, but you're here in person. That's a, a hope for all of us, right? Yeah. To be able to hug again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you to the members. Yeah. yeah. Do I do, maybe just to, uh, to acknowledge also the... The, the all of the members what an import, important role members and volunteer oh, play yes. in these places that are are I, you know i believe are changing our worlds in positive ways so thanks to you all thank you yeah. thank you and again this is important so you can watch it again on youtube and our facebook page thank you everyone enjoy your afternoon bye everyone bye